Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwensa Garden in Ireland and you are very welcome to this video, which is a question and answer session. So if you want answers to some of the questions I've been asked over the course of making YouTube videos like Dwensa, why is my garden called Dwensa? Or what zone am I in? Or how did I start out in gardening? Then do stay tuned. <laughs> I want to start off by saying a great big thank you to everyone who took the time to submit questions, whether it was a couple of months ago or right now. And I have been collecting some of these questions up and hope to address them here in the video. Anyone who did ask a question previously got a reply there on the video at the time, but I just thought some of them might be relevant to other people because if one person asks a question, then the likelihood is that dozens more are actually thinking the same thing, so it makes sense to address them. So I guess best thing to do is to kick off with the leading question of where does the name Duenza Garden come from? And this was asked more recently by the people that have their comments going up on the screen here. And the truth is that Dwensa is a place in Mali, in West Africa, where I spent some time many, many moons ago. Now, in rural Ireland, most houses don't have numbers, so you can give your house a name. And myself and my husband loved Dwensa so much, for a couple of reasons I'll go into in a minute, that when we bought our house we decided we'd call the house Dwensa. And then eventually the garden developed and became known to the public and that became known as Dwensa Garden after the name of the house. So why did I love Dwensa so much? And it's really hard to describe this one, but all I can say is that there was one night on a rooftop just before or in the middle of or after a storm. It wasn't actually raining, but up on the rooftop, you could see the sky that stretched for miles and miles around in every direction. And you could see the clouds, the storm clouds brewing and dissipating and moving across. And it was just such an animated and lively thing that I never saw anywhere else that it made a complete impression. And I suppose, honestly, like I count it as one of the most important experiences of my life. My husband felt the same way as well. So when we got our house, we decided that we would name it Dwensa. Now, Long-term subscribers will recall that a few years ago, I made a couple of videos about my travels in West Africa. I never actually got as far as Dwensa in the videos. There were two videos, I think, and I linked them up above, but I guess I ran out of steam. They were videos that showed photographs that had been taken at the time. And yeah, so if you're interested in more information about that part of the world, then do check out those videos. So that's the reply to the first question. The second question that keeps coming up was recently submitted by my boy Bill. And there is the question going up and it relates to the fact that I used to be known as the unglamorous gardener when I started out the channel. Now, I think many people have interpreted this the wrong way. It's not like I was putting myself down in any way. I kind of looked on it as a badge of honor. I mean, gardeners aren't supposed to be glamorous. And I think very often the state of our nails, the dirt under them and the brokenness of them is an indication of how well our gardens are doing. So I didn't I didn't say it to denigrate myself in any way. And thank you to everyone who's come to my defense and said, oh no, you know, you shouldn't call yourself that because it's not true. I do appreciate you saying that, whether, okay, thank you. But there's there really is no need for it. <laughs> now, why did I stop using the term unglamorous gardener? And the truth is that when I say unglamorous gardener, very often it is heard as young glamorous gardener, 
which is exactly the opposite of what I meant. So I didn't want people, I mean, I'm not young. <laughs> Whatever about glamorous, I am certainly a gardener. So um, I decided to just do away with that term because it was confusing. I think the main thing is that my channel is all about the plants and the plants are the glamorous ones here. It's not about me and how I look, it's about the plants and helping you learn certain techniques that you might find useful in your garden or introducing you to plants that you might love. So that was the emphasis when I settled on the, um, I suppose, ungainly title of unglamorous gardener. Another common question is, what zone are you in? And because this is asked so frequently, I have recently started mentioning it at the beginning of my garden tour videos. So let me just explain. The hardiness zone is really an American term that isn't used here in Europe. I know in the UK they have their own set of hardiness rating which is different from the US one um, and in Australia they don't use this rating either. However, having said all that, I would say that where I live roughly equates to US hardiness zone 9. Now, zone 9 will indicate that you can grow a variety of plants that I simply can't grow. And that's because the rainfall here in Ireland is a lot greater than it would be normally in zone nine. So things rot over winter rather than freeze, they rot. And also in summer, we have less sun that you might expect for a zone nine. So it's that little bit different, but yeah, we roughly equate to a zone nine. And I have to remember to keep saying that at the beginning of the garden tour videos. Next up, we have a recent question from Jerome Gagnon and Wanda Shaw, both long-term subscribers to the channel. And they asked me about wish list plants, let's just say, for the coming year. So whether they be outdoor plants or indoor plants, and I suppose it is the time of year where we set out with new resolutions and it can be a great time to start looking out for the things that we yearn for in preparation for the gardening year. Now, I really can't say that a lot has changed in terms of my wish list. Certainly the Velvitsia, which is that beautiful, is it beautiful? Let's just say ugly with character plant that comes from the Namibian desert. That is still number one on my wish list. This isn't a garden plant. This is something that would be kept in a greenhouse or a house, house plant collection. No sign of getting my hands on that yet. And some of the caudex plants that I mentioned before, like the Ipomoea, for example, which has beautiful flowers and a big, a, a big bottom, let's just say, a big uh, succulent structure that sits on top of the soil. I just find those plants so absolutely fascinating. I, I, I do have an Ipomoea, not an Ipomoea, um, Ibervillea at the moment, which um, is an enormous caudex structure and I absolutely love it to bits. It has just come back into leaf again after its winter dormancy. So that's very exciting. So always on the lookout for new caudex plants and the bigger, the better. Otherwise, I can perhaps, yeah, there's a clematis, but this isn't a climbing clematis, it's a herbaceous clematis that doesn't climb called Durandii, which I've been on the lookout for a couple of years since I saw it in the Helen Dillon garden in 2020. So I would really love to get my hands on those beautiful blue flowers, but it just seems to be something that was quite uh, common a few years back, but is very hard to source now. So I will be keeping a lookout for that. But otherwise, I guess I'll start looking around and adding things to my wish list very soon because, you know, if you have a passion and a love for plants, those wish lists are always very close to our heart. Jerome also asked in the same breath about the rarest plant in my garden. And oh my goodness, but that's a good question. And I 
had to sit down and think hard about it. Now, I suppose at one stage, the rarest plant in my garden was Simplocarpus, um, which is a, well, it, it, it's part, it's an aroid uh, and it comes from North America, I believe, a bog plant that, uh, well, I, it's just a really unusual looking thing that takes an absolute age to grow from seed. So a friend of mine grew from seed and I got my hands on one of them and I planted in the garden, but I think I've actually lost it, unfortunately. So this was not a plant that would come very high off the soil. It, it would just be like about this tall with a kind of a, a beak on it, very unusual and exotic looking. But the big thing with it was that underneath the earth, the root goes down, down, down. I suppose in the same way as the Velvitia that I've just talked about. And once you've planted this plant, even if it's in the wrong place, you, there's no way you can move it because the root is just so extensive. Also, it's one of the few plants that actually generate heat. So I believe it grows in places where it's very frosty and the beak kind of um, heats the surface of the soil and pokes up through the ice, which is really, really, really unusual. So yeah, I don't actually think it's still around. If it's still in the garden, it's a very weak specimen because it wasn't really put in the right position. In terms of other rare plants, a few years back, I visited Krug Farm in Wales and bought myself a couple of things which were very rare at the time, like the Daphnophyllum bush, the Trochodendron, and even the perennial Glaucidium, which you've heard me talk about. But I see that these plants are now kind of available, if in Ireland anyway, if you, if you look hard for them. So I guess they're not really that rare anymore. Uh, Oh yeah, there was one other thing, which was a rhododendron called barbatum, which I sourced from a specialised rhododendron nursery in Scotland. And it's very, it was, this was at the time before Brexit, so we could get plants in Ireland from the UK. And anyway, I got my hands on rhododendron barbatum and it's in the garden. And the thing about this rhododendron is that eventually the mature trunk gets a gorgeous, gorgeous peeling bark and it looks absolutely amazing. Now, I've had it in the garden for several years, but it really isn't at that stage yet. But it does flower now and beautiful red flowers it has as well. So I guess rhododendron barbatum is up there as one of the rarer things in my garden. And thank you for that question, Jerome. Another great question was asked by Victoria, who asked about pest control in my greenhouse. And this is a really good question because, you know, when you have a greenhouse and a lot of different plants in close proximity, especially over winter when plants are struggling a bit because of the low temperatures, then you do tend to get pests. So certainly I think preemptiveness is the important thing in terms of pest control in a greenhouse. So I, I'm vigilant. I constantly keep an eye out for pests like white fly or aphids even, or that kind of thing in the greenhouse. And I treat with chemical sprays. I'm a great believer in Rose Clear, which is a kind of fungal spray basically designed for roses, but I do use it in the greenhouse. And I've used neem oil as well uh, a couple of years ago. And I think really the most important thing that I do is that when I discover pests, I isolate the plant. So I move it away from everything else and I treat it. And if it's in summer, then the plant goes outside the greenhouse. So if something is suffering from aphids or whatever, I put it out. Pelagoniums are one of the worst culprits in my greenhouse for mealybug. I haven't really had the white fly so much, but a little bit. And if they suffer, they spray, they get put outside. Also, I had a, a dandelion tree, a tree dandelion last year, which came really badly down with white fly. And I just 
ripped it out of the greenhouse border. It was early spring at the time, so I took a chance, planted it in the garden and it flowered, which was amazing. It flowered during the summer. Now it's a monocarpic plant, so it was going to die after flowering, but at least I got to see the flowers. So I think really vigilance and preemptiveness in terms of dealing with pests is the best advice that I can give. There was an orchid question from Julia who asked how my orchids were doing over the winter since I have stopped using two of my three grow lights. And I have to tell you, Julia, that the orchids are doing fine. I have come to the conclusion that grow lights may be excellent for certain people but for me I really yeah I, I'm not sure they are look I have a grow light that I use in a position where the plants get no natural light but my other orchids my cattleyas for example which are highlight plants I find that they do best just on a south facing window now up until last year one of the sets of plants on a south facing window also had a grow light over it and that's the one that I switched off this year and also since last year my third grow light I had actually just used on South African bulbs in the house rather than the orchids. So the phasing out has been gradual in terms of using the grow lights for the orchids. Also, I find that as with all orchids, the answer is never as simple as it sounds. So we may think that our grow lights, by getting a lumen reading from them, that we have the amount of light correct but you also have to consider the power reading and I have had instances where my orchids were getting too high a par with the result that they were burning even though the light reading the lumen reading was correct so you know yeah just a little something to consider and juggle as is always the case with orchids but personally I find that they just do best the highlight ones, the cattleyas anyway, on a south facing windowsill. I hope that answers your question. There was another question from Charlie Brown who asked about my xanthosoma, which is this beautiful plant here. And I made a video a while ago, I'd completely forgotten about this, when I got the plant. Well, it has done so, so well. Just look at it. Am I gonna lift this down and uh, cause a, a problem? Yes, of course I am. So I repotted this plant when I got it just over a year ago now. So it wasn't bought last year in 2022, it was bought just before that. And since then it has gone on and done great things. Now, as you can see, it sits on a humidity tray, a bed of pebbles. And if I lift up here, as always happens with these blooming things, the roots come out of the base of the pot and go down into the water and then the clay pebbles stick to the base. So that's gonna be a pig to repot. But it's doing, it's doing really well and uh, it seems to be responding well to the humidity tray. I do have some brown tips. I think actually this one is just an older yellowing leaf, but I do have some brown tips, this one here has a little bit of a brown tip there at the side. So it's not quite getting as much humidity as it should, but it's doing well, isn't it? I think also that some of the leaves, the patterning seems to be fading a bit like with that one. So that must be a light issue. Cause I do keep this on, look, if I were to tell you it was on a north facing windowsill, it would be a lie because I don't even have it on the windowsill. It's near a north facing windowsill and it has done really well. So it's fantastic, isn't it? And you may note if you follow um, Plants and Things, the Canadian channel where Bill um, grows a variety of different plants, but he bought one of these at roughly the same time that I did. And as far as I recall, his is doing really well as well. So I would not be afraid of buying this plant and trying it out. It seems to respond well to the conditions I give it anyway. So in a cooler house, I suppose you're talking 18 to 24 degrees centigrade because I keep it in the warmest room. 
uh, good humidity watering once a week and yeah Bob's your uncle or Santa Soma is your uncle. <laughs> The next question was from Franz, who asked me very interestingly if I could live anywhere in the world and garden anywhere in the world, where would that be? And oh my goodness, this is, I had to think about this long and hard. But at the moment, I must say that I'm very attracted to tropical plants and tropical climates. So I would probably choose somewhere like Singapore or Malaysia or Thailand. Now, if I were to garden there, I would have to learn from scratch because <laughs> the gardening that I do with the climate I have and the different seasons would just not be applicable there at all. And I follow on Instagram James Wong, who's a Singaporean born a British gardener, quite well known in the UK. And he has, he's called a Botany Geek, so do check out his Instagram. But he has recently published a video series on Instagram on Singaporean gardens. And oh my goodness, like just the first episode shows the airport in Singapore and what they've done in there. And it's just absolutely mouthwatering in terms of tropical paradise and big leaves and feeling like you're in a, a jungle, but I wouldn't say a tame jungle, but a, a safe, beautiful jungle. So do check him out. And for the moment, if I had to garden anywhere, I think, I can kind of be veering in that direction. In terms of travel as well, I would absolutely love to visit Borneo. Uh, so Borneo is, um, the island of Borneo is partly um, inside the country of Malaysia, partly inside the country of Indonesia, and then there's an independent little state in there. So I guess you're talking about the Malaysian side of Borneo because there are some amazing untouched tropical forests there that I would love to see. Next up, Annie asked me about my husband and does he like the garden and what are his favorite plants? So I asked him and he says, yes, he loves the garden. <laughs> I think he said it honestly, it wasn't just to kind of humor me. And his favorite plants are the Sambucus or the elder. So he loves anything that is edible and the Sambucus bushes, when they're in full bloom, really are fantastic. They look amazing. And he collects the berries that follow and makes them into jelly. And so I guess for those two reasons, he loves them. He also loves the Sinara or the, um, what do you call it? The Cardoon, yeah, the Cardoon. And uh, that makes a great ornamental plant as well because it's got these bluish large palmate leaves I guess you might call them although they are quite long but it's a great plant and he says those two are among his favorites just as a side note whenever he is talking about a plant and he doesn't know the name which is quite often he refers to it as a calendula yeah a calendula so it's that calendula there that calendula there or that calendula there I know next up Trenton asked me about cottage gardens and I believe he's just starting up a cottage garden and was looking for some books to read about it or some online resources and cottage gardens are just so popular right now and they are so beautiful that I'm sure you're going to find lots of resources about it. But I will link in the description to a couple of places that you should go and check out. The first is um, there's a Gardener's World link where they have information on their top 12 cottage garden plants. So foxgloves, roses, estranches. I'm not exactly sure what they are. Pinks, I think, are in there. But if you really don't know a lot about which plants to choose, then do check that out. Also, there's a great American resource called the Spruce, and I saw that they have a kind of an introduction guide to cottage gardens, so do check that out. And if you want to buy some books, 
then I highly recommend anything by Penelope Hobhouse, who was the lady who designed Wisley Gardens in the UK and all her books are fabulous. Also Roy Strong on garden design, which is the first ever gardening book that I was given by my mother who, who was very much into gardening. And I can certainly say if you are new to the subject, then that is a great place to start because it goes through the various principles, not specifically for cottage garden, but you know, things like line of sight and uh, paths and flowering hedges and all these kinds of things. So do check that out. So those two links to the spruce and the gardener's world um, information, I'll put those in the details of this video. And I hope that helps you out and best of luck. I am sure your garden is going to be absolutely fabulous. And in the same vein, I got another query from Rosie in Dublin, who lives in a coastal location and has a north facing garden. Now, Rosie wants to grow perennials and she wants to grow grasses, tall grasses, to kind of screen and give a sense of privacy. But she is impacted by the fact that her garden is north facing. And I can tell you that grasses generally are a plant that need full sun. So you're not going to have a grass garden, but there are some that can do well in shady positions. And two of them are ones that I grow. So there's Hakenicloa, the yellow form, which isn't terribly tall, and I know you do want tall, but it is yellow. And so in a dark shady um, corner, this does a fabulous job of just lighting up the whole area. Uh, a lovely grass, and it'll clump up in time and make a sizable clump, which looks very well. There's also the uh, pheasant tail grass, which has a terrible name beginning with A. I'll write the name up on it on the screen. But this is a gorgeous one, very, very tactile. And at the end of the summer, it has long, long tassels that kind of come away in your hand. Very, very beautiful. And when they glitter in the sun, they're kind of orangey. Very, very nice. This one gets quite tall, I suppose, maybe about three foot, something like that. So maybe that's more in line with what you're looking for. I've also published numerous videos on shade loving plants, um, individual videos on myanthemum, which used to be known as Melusina, Roscoa, Rogersia, Virginia. All of these can be grown in shade. I did a recent video on three flowering plants for shade, which again dealt with the Smilacina. I guess I'll link to that video down below. And recently I did a collab with the wonderful Alexandra at the Middle Sized Garden. And the shady plant that I recommended to her viewers was the Podophyllum, which I absolutely love. And I'll link to that video down below as well. So there's lots of food for thought. I'll also link to the RHS website. And the RHS website is wonderful because they have lists of plants for particular situations. So on that list, besides perennials for deep shade and perennials for dappled shade, you will also find a list of grasses for shade. So do check that out, Rosie, and I'm sure that your north facing garden will soon bloom in beautiful, beautiful color. And this brings me on to the final question, which is from Grandma Gwen. And this came about when I was talking about my book recently and I mentioned the fact that I don't have a horticultural background. And she was surprised at this. And it's true, I don't have a horticultural background. So I started out very much an amateur and that was, I suppose, many years ago. I wanted a nice garden, but I certainly wasn't prepared to put the work in. And my mother, who was a garden designer, had designed my pocket handkerchief sized back garden and she was going to do all the planting. Uh, she was just taking control of it. And then I suppose 
something clicked and it was around about the time that I had a, a miscarriage and I just like one day sat up and said I'm going to plant that garden and I had I went to a garden centre and I started buying the most <laughs> ridiculous things like I bought a eucalyptus tree this is for a tiny tiny back garden and I bought a, a pyracantha the one with the enormous great big thorns because I like the beautiful colour of the berries and I brought them all back and I know my mum just threw her eyes to heaven but she was happy then because at least I had finally come around to her passion and her way of thinking and her interest she began to share her interest so I, I started from there I knew nothing and um, I started reading books and this is the great thing about gardening if you can read and if you have an interest in researching plants then you can find all the information online when I started out, you had to invest at least in an encyclopedia of plants, but you don't even have to do that nowadays because all of the information is there. The RHS website is amazing nowadays for just giving you all that information on different plants, although I do occasionally reference my old encyclopedias. So I continued in a very kind of enthusiastic way for a number of years and then eventually 16 years ago the Irish Garden magazine which is the only Irish gardening magazine asked me to write for them and I do that to write up until this day so you know I guess I'm telling you this story to let you know that if you don't have a horticultural background if you haven't been to uh, college that doesn't matter if you're interested in plants you can certainly certainly become an excellent gardener and an excellent plant person so i really would encourage anybody not to be held back and don't be like put off by what other people might say there's a lot of online nonsense where you know people like to blow their own horn and say how wonderful they are and just put other people down especially in the orchid area i think but really you know you, you need you need to be strong you need to muscle in i mean what they don't know you they don't know anything about you they don't know what you can be or become so yeah those are my words of advice and just then on the same vein I was reminded of my first experiences of gardening that's not the right term my first awareness of gardening when I was very little and I know that when I was very little for one birthday I was given instead of a pram because girls were all given prams and they wheeled their dolls around in them but I was given a wheelbarrow <laughs> and it was a toy wheelbarrow and it was full of smarties so my mother had bought I suppose dozens and dozens of packets of smarties and filled the wheelbarrow with it so I came down and I found this for my birthday so that's a very early and very fond memory and I also recall when I was very young going on a school tour to the Botanic Gardens and having my lunch on the lawn and just looking up from my lunch and seeing this amazing amazing glass house and thinking to myself yes I've I've been here before I've been brought to this place before and I like it I really like glass houses I love the smell I love the look and not so much the plants but just the vibe so that is a very fond memory for myself and then finally because I, I don't want to go on about this too long but I recall when I was little my mother actually gave me a flower bed to tend and seeds to grow um, to grow plants from a lot of annuals I guess and one of the plants she gave me was love lies bleeding or amaranthus you know the one with the long red tassels and the bed that she gave me had a concrete edge to it that came down over onto the lawn so I planted up all the plants and 
um, promptly forgot about it. I'm sure I didn't weed it once because <laughs> I was small at the time and nobody likes weeding. And then I suppose a month later or a couple of months later during the summer, we went back and looked at the bed together and it was a mess with all the weeds. But what I do recall is this Love Lies Bleeding, which came out in long red tassels and hung over the edge of the bed. And I just thought, oh, isn't that beautiful? And hasn't it been so good to do so well with so little input from me? But yeah, and what a strange name. And I'd ask my mom, why is it called Love Lies Bleeding? And she'd just, she'd give me a knowing smile and say, I suppose you'll understand when you're older. So anyway, those are my earliest gardening or plant memories. And um, yeah, if you would like to let me know what yours are, share them, just jot, jot them in the comments down below. It's always interesting to see how people came forth and what it was that triggered their passion of plants in them. And also, if you have more questions, then don't be afraid to jot them down below. I probably won't do another Q&A video for a while, but I will answer your questions. So thank you for watching, as always. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Thank you to everybody who has watched this video and who watches my videos regularly, or indeed reads my pages in the Irish Garden magazine. And I guess I will see you on the next video. Bye.